Dear friends, greetings in Jesus. We've been looking this weekend at the book of Jeremiah, a sefer shel Yermiyahu Hanavi, in the original Hebrew. Turn with me, please, to Jeremiah chapter 8. Jeremiah chapter 8. As we noted yesterday, Jeremiah, like all of Israel's prophets, is prophesying for three different time frames. For his own time, the events leading up to 585, 586 BC, for the first coming of the Messiah, and also for the return of the Messiah. And so much of the New Testament eschatology, the New Testament teaching on the last days, derives from the book of Jeremiah. We see this in the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24, Luke 21, etc. And this chapter is a crucial chapter in the study of end time prophecy. We read about it beginning in verse 17, I am be sending serpents against you, adders for which there is no charm. They will bite you, declares the Lord. Jeremiah goes into the first person, my sorrow is beyond healing. My heart is faint within me. Behold, listen, the cry of the daughter of my people from a distant land. Is the Lord not in Zion? Is her king not within her? Why have they provoked me with their graven images and foreign idols? Harvest is past, summer is ended, and we are not saved. For the brokenness of the daughter of my people, I am broken. I mourn, I dismay. Dismay has taken hold of me. Is there no bomb in Gilead? Is there no position there? Why then has not the help of the daughter of my people been restored? Harvest is ended, summer is past, and we are not saved. We are told in Matthew 25, we will see this kind of lament with the foolish virgins who were not ready for the coming of Christ. They had a lamp, but no oil in it. A torch, a flashlight, as it were, with no batteries. They had the book, but no illumination of the Holy Spirit. It was just an ornament, just a book they read ritually. That's all it was. Harvest is past, summer is ended, and we are not saved. Is there no bomb in Gilead? Well, no, there's no bomb in Gilead. Many people today, particularly in America, are saying some very foolish things which are being exported to other countries. That the rapture is going to engender a great worldwide revival. Well, when we read the book of Revelation and other scriptures, we see that it is undoubtedly true. Once the faithful church is removed, God turns his focus back to dealing with Israel and the Jews primarily. He's dealing primarily with Israel and the Jews, not with the nations. The time of the nations, the time of the Gentiles is over. It will not be a good time. And we even have people now teaching some outrageously false things. Um, you can worship the Antichrist. You can worship the image of the beast and take the mark of the beast and still be saved. This is John MacArthur, somebody who used to be a conservative. Now he's teaching flat-out error. No, it's like the foolish virgins. Harvest is past, summer has ended, and they will know they were not saved. It is only the faithful church who is going to be rescued out of here. There's no bomb in Gilead. 
God will deal with Israel, but in a very dark hour of Israel's history, Tekofat of Sarat Yaakov, the time of Jacob's trouble. But before this happens, something else is going to happen. Jesus spoke of deception increasing. Remember, he spoke of deception far more than he warned of anything else as a sign of the end. Wars, rumors of wars, famines, earthquake, pestilence. He spoke of those things one time each. But of deception perpetrated against believers and against Israel, he spoke four times more than anything else as a sign of the end, deception. I'm sending serpents. The Lord is sending serpents. Adders, for which there is no charm. They will bite you, declares the Lord. What is this talking about? In judgment, God is going to send serpents that are going to bite serpents that cannot be charmed. Look with me, please, to the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 10, verse 11. In Hebrew, we call Ecclesiastes Kohelet, Kohelet. If the serpent bites before being charmed, there's no profit for the charmer. If the serpent bites before you can charm it, you're in trouble. We have to know how to charm the serpent. I recall one time I was in Mumbai, India. Bombay, huge city, humongous city. And uh, I often tell the story because I'll never forget having seen this. A mound of stinking rubbish, garbage, with a little baby boy about 18 months laying on top of it. He was obviously severely malnourished and tubercular. And uh, thousands of people an hour were passing him by, thousands. This is the middle of a huge city. And there's only one of God knows how many thousands just in that city. And he was there, and people passing, he just left them there. And right up the road, this is in a big city now, right up the road, they were feeding cows sacks of wheat. I saw it with my own eyes. In Hinduism, the life of a cow was worth more than the life of a baby, and I saw it with my own eyes. And I come back to Britain or America, and I see people going to ashrams and gurus. And <laughs> Look what that religion has done for India. Look what it's done through India. And these are intelligent people. When they come to the West, they become engineers and <clears throat> physicians and economists. And <laughs> these are intelligent people. Look what that religion has done for India. But anyway, I went down to the gate of India where the snake charmers were, the Swami. And I watched them doing it. And so I decided to give it a try. <laughs> I wanted to have a batch. It's done with motion. So the Swami, the guy, the thing, he gave me the flute. And I began doing it. And the cobra came out like this, with eye contact. It's going like this. Uh, I had a photo taken. My daughter pinned it on the wall of her bedroom because it looked so absurd. <laughs> the Swami was there, and then me and the, and the cobra coming out of the basket. Well, I opened with the rendition of Blue Suede Shoes, but it became <laughs> cantankerous. So I, I quickly switched to Amazing Grace to calm him down. <laughs> <laughs> I, our daughter Beth has the photo. I just I, I, Charming the snake! What is Ecclesiastes talking about? What is Jeremiah talking about? What is this? Charming of the serpent. Look with me, please, to the New Testament, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul writes to the church in Corinth in verse 3, But I'm afraid, lest as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds should be led astray from the simplicity and purity 
of devotion to Christ. For if one comes and preaches another Jesus, whom we've not preached, or you receive a different spirit which you've not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you bear it beautifully. When you see people believing a distorted Jesus, a different Jesus than the one of the scriptures, obviously the Eucharistic Christ of the Roman Church is a different Jesus, obviously the Latter-day Saints Jesus is a different Jesus, obviously the Isa of Islam is a different Jesus, but there's so many people professing to be evangelicals have this anthropomorphic Jesus. They've made Jesus in their own image and likeness instead of the Jesus of the scripture. We continue to read what it's like. A different gospel. It doesn't matter, of course, if it's the sacramental gospel or the word faith gospel or the positive confession gospel. There are many different gospels in these last days. They've always been around, but they increase in the last days. And a different spirit. The fruit of the spirit is, of course, self-control, ikrete, we are told twice. I've seen phenomena where people are on the floor imitating animals. They were actually imitating animals, saying it was the Holy Spirit. In scripture, the mind of a beast was given to Nebuchadnezzar. The only place you see people being given by God to imitate animals was a judgment. We're not Jodei beings made in his image and likeness. We are not made in the image and likeness of animals. But I, there are churches where they're actually barking and things like this. Absurd. This is another spirit. This is not the Holy Spirit. It's not the Holy Spirit. It's not the real Jesus. Talk to somebody saying that at Catholicism. They will tell you. Our Jesus said, if anybody says I've come back physically, don't believe it. I'm coming back the way I left. Every eye will see. They say every time there's a mass, the bread and wine is transubstantiated. Jesus has returned physically. And they actually worship and pray to the bread and wine. The Eucharistic Christ of Rose, a different Jesus. People are saying now that Mormonism is, is compatible with Christianity. Mormonism teaches that their Jesus, the Latter-day Saints Jesus, is the spirit brother of Satan. The Jesus of Scripture is the monogenes, the only begotten of the Father. Now, there's even Christians teaching Chrislam. We can unite with Islam. Mm -hmm. their, Jesus is their Jesus is inferior to Mohammed. He's not the son of God. God has no son. Paul says people bear this beautifully because the serpent beguiled them. Israel and the church are in the character of Eve, the woman. Jesus is, of course, the last Adam. By nature, we've explained before, because of the fall of man, something has happened to us. Men have become insensitive and women have become hypersensitive. I apologize to those who know this. Men have become insensitive because of the fall and women have become hypersensitive. When a husband and wife get saved, it's usually the wife gets saved first because males have insensitivity. It's easier for women to get saved. When a husband and wife pray for direction, it's usually the wife who hears from the Lord first and clearest, because men lack sensitivity. That's one side of the equation. The fall has met, rendered males insensitive. Well, anything God intends for good, the world, the flesh, and the devil will use for evil. The same fall of man has rendered women hypersensitive. While it's easier for women to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, it's easier for women to be seduced by a counterfeit spirit. It's easier for women to be misled. Women are much more vulnerable to spiritual seduction than men. We might say the male antenna is too short, the female antenna is too long. The male antenna, it doesn't pick up the signal too easily. But when it gets it, it's usually the right one. Female antenna can pick up any signal. Sometimes two contradictory signals at the same time and somehow manage to make sense of it. <laughs> That's why leadership is male. It's protective. <clears throat> Men are reliant on female sensitivity. 
It is a foolish husband who does not listen carefully to the counsel of a praying wife, not a nagging wife. <laughs> that turns guys off. But a praying wife. It is a foolish husband that does not give careful weight to the counsel of a praying wife. It is also a very foolish wife who does not submit to the authority of a protective husband. Women are reliant on male protection as men are reliant on female sensitivity. The serpent will always beguile the woman. Satan can't con Jesus, so he cons his wife. Couldn't con Yehoah, so he cons Israel. Didn't go straight to Adam, went to Eve. The whole mess we see in the Middle East to this day, the whole mess we see in the Middle East to this day, ontogenetically and significantly goes back to Abraham not being the spiritual head of the family of marriage when the situation came with Hagar. It goes back to the male not being the spiritual head. This whole mess you see in the Middle East to this day in large part goes back to Abraham and Sarah and Hagar. Quite a situation. Quite the situation. The serpent beguiles the woman. He's always trying to seduce the church. It goes right to Genesis chapter 3. The serpent, the Nahash, is crafty. He's crafty. Picture of Satan, the seducer. He was obviously a, at least a biped, if not a quadruped. I don't believe that dinosaurs became extinct 65 million years ago. In fact, they still exist. I've seen them several times in the Taronga Zoo in Sydney, Australia. They're called Kamada dragons. They're 22 feet long. They'll kill you with one simple nibble. Mm -hmm. The bacteria is highly toxic, and they're 22 feet long lizards. I'd like to throw a Darwinist over the fence to see, see if he believes that dinosaurs became extinct. <laughs> Half of that thing has his lunch, you won't believe it. He won't be at all this thing anymore. Quite a thing. No, the thing was obviously able to walk. Hence, in Genesis, you see the dragon and the serpent, the walking snake and the crawling snake. And so in the book of Revelation, chapter 12, we see the dragon and the serpent. They're cast down to you. The dragon is Satan, the persecutor. The serpent is always Satan, the seducer. He has two modes of attack, but in the last days, it's both. Look with me, please, to the book of Revelation, chapter 12. <clears throat> Verse 14, two wings of a great eagle were given to the woman in order that she might fly to the wilderness where she was never for a time, times, and a half time, one half of the last seven years of history, from the presence of the serpent. And the serpent poured water like a river out of her mouth. And then the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and drank up the river which the dragon poured out of his mouth. The dragon and the serpent are the same creature, simply two different modes of attack. Satan attacks the church by persecution, he attacks Israel by persecution, but he also attacks by seduction. But in the last days, we're told by Jeremiah, the Lord is going to send these serpents. What is that talking about? God is going to send the Nahashim to bite. This is difficult. Remember in the days of King Ahab, the true prophets were rejected. He chose false prophets. There were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of false prophets, at least 420 to one. Micaiah was the true prophet. And he said, the Lord is going to put a lying spirit in the mouth of your prophets to make you believe what is false. Well, what are we told in 2 Thessalonians concerning the Antichrist? The Lord will send a deluding influence upon them to make them believe what is false, because they do not love a knowledge of the truth. People who reject the truth of Scripture, 
God is going to say, as he said in the days of Ahab. You want false prophets? Oh, I'll send you a false prophet. You want to be seduced by a snake? Oh, I'll send you a snake. You want another Christ? Oh, I'll, I'll send you another Christ. The Antichrist and the false prophet will be from Satan. But they'll also be God's judgment. The Lord will give people over to them. Just as happened in the days of Ahab and Jezebel, just the same. The Lord will send a deluding influence. Jeremiah tells us, God is going to send these snakes and they will bite before they are charmed. The only hope you have is to charm the snake. Can you charm the snake? If you cannot charm the snake, the snake is going to bite you. Let's understand how this works. <coughs> the snake was crafty. Snake, serpent, bash. However, there is a way to charm it. Lachash. Lachash. Charming the snake before it bites. Now, this is a very interesting term in Hebrew, but let's look at a few examples of it. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 3, verse 3. Isaiah chapter 3, verse 20. Headdresses, ankle chains, sashes, perfume boxes, and what we translate amulets in Hebrew is nachash. It was some kind of a bracelet to ward off, not in the fetish sense, but in a, a sense of a protective amulet against a nachash. Isaiah 26, 26. Isaiah, oh, 16, sorry. Oh Lord, they sought thee in distress. They could only whisper a prayer, thy chastening was upon them. That whispered prayer is a lachash. A lachash means a secret or whispered incantation. A secret or whispered incantation that protects from evil. A secret or whispered incantation to the Lord that protects from evil. Lachash. Again, it only occurs in the original text. It does not come across in translation. But in Isaiah, this term, lahash, occurs with another term, bayin. It's a very old word for being able to distinguish, distinguish, or discern, discern. It's not enough to know the incantation. You have to be able to discern when to use it. You must be able to distinguish spirits. In the New Testament, this is called discernment of spirits. 
Now, not everybody has the gift of discernment of spirits, but we should all know if something is doctrinally wrong or morally wrong. You don't have to be a physician to know if you have a fever or an infection or a cough. We all have to know if something is morally or doctrinally wrong. Can you distinguish? Can you discern? If you can distinguish and discern, you can have machash. You can charm the snake before it bites. But people who do not have discernment, people who do not know how to distinguish spirits, people who don't understand the incantation, will not be able to charm the snake. The serpent will bite them. They are sitting prey for the devil. Jeremiah says, the only hope is if you can charm the snake. Ecclesiastes says, you have to charm the snake before it bites. Look with me, please, to the book of Numbers, chapter 21, verse 6. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many of them died. Just like in Jeremiah, God sends these things in judgment. You look at the absurdity of it. One televangelist after another is exposed as a con artist, and people will still send them money. You want to follow a snake? The Lord will send snakes to bite you. People are not judged for their sin. They are judged by them. The Lord will send the deluding angels. He sent these snakes in the book of Numbers. God sends them. Look with me, please, to the book of Exodus, chapter 7. Verses 10 to 12. So Moses and Aaron came to Pharaoh, and thus they did as the Lord had commanded, and Aaron threw his staff down before Pharaoh and his servant. And it became a serpent. And Pharaoh called for his wise men and the sorcerers. And they also, the magicians of Egypt, did the same with their secret arts. For each threw down his staff and turned into serpents. But Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. Yet Pharaoh's heart was hardened. He did not listen to them, as the Lord had said. What is this talking about? We know what the Nahash is, the deceiver is. Now Paul tells us about this in 2 uh, Timothy, doesn't he? Pharaoh's magicians, he gives the names from, from the Mishnah, from Jewish history, uh, Jonas and Jambres. And he puts it into an end times, into an eschatological context for the church. In the last days, deceivers are going to come into the church in the character of Jonas and Jambres. As we've been saying for many years, the same as Jonas and John Brace counterfeited the miracles of Moses and Aaron as a picture of the way the Antichrist and false prophet are going to counterfeit the miracles of Jesus and his witnesses. It's going to be counterfeit. It's going to happen in the last days. But Aaron's rod turned into a snake and ate their snake. The only one who can outcon the con man is the Lord. The only one who can outcon Satan is the Lord. Satan is infinitely smarter almost than any of us. In fact, he's almost infinitely smarter than all of us put together. He will win every time. He will win every battle. Unless we know how to charm the snake. We don't like saying good things about him. 
but he certainly knows his business, and he has a lot of experience. The only one who can calm him is the Lord. Aaron's snake ate their snakes. Remember what the New Testament tells us? If they knew God would raise him from the dead, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. It's the gambit, the quintessential gambit in the ultimate chess game. Check, no, checkmate, resurrection. Ultimately, God wins. The Lord can con the cons. This snake will eat their snake. Jesus how comes the devil every time. But the devil can buy us. He can sure deceive us. Unless we know how to charm him. Turn with me, please, to Deuteronomy chapter 32. Begin in verse 28. They're a nation lacking in counsel. There's no understanding in them. Would that they were wise and they understood that they would discern the future. But they don't know what's coming. They don't know what's coming. Unsaved, unbelieving Israel don't know what's coming. In the mainstream church, most of it doesn't know what's coming. How could one chase a thousand and two put ten thousand to flight unless their rock had sold them and the Lord had given them up? Indeed, their rock is not like our rock. Even our enemies themselves judge this. For their vine is from the vine of Sodom, and from the fields of Gomorrah, their grapes are of poison, their clusters bitter. Their wine is the venom of serpents and the deadly poison of cobras. Notice how the cobra in this context, that is the serpent, is associated with the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah. If there's ever been a deception that is unbelievable in its magnitude, it's the increasing acceptance, even among people who profess to be born again, of things like same-sex marriage, homosexuality, and lesbianism. This would have been unthinkable at one time. Now you have people professing to be mainstream evangelical believers caving in on it. Steve Chalk, the biggest youth minister in this country, calling on the church to change its position on same-sex marriage and to condone it. Cliff Richards, calling on the church to condone it. Gee, I wonder why. Tony Campolo caving in on this issue. Brian McLaren, the leader of the emergent church, performing the same sex marriage for his son and his son's husband. Boy, has the serpent bitten them. They're in Sodom and Gomorrah. They think they're going to heaven. The wine of the serpent is bitter. It's because we are told in this passage, in verse 31, their rock is not like our rock. They have built on the wrong foundation. Their rock is not like our rock. Unless you're built on the rock, you're in trouble. The serpent's going to get them. Quite a thing. Notice the relationship between the venom and the wine. Turn with me, please, to the book of Acts, chapter 16, verses 16 and 17. This is when Paul first arrives in Europe, Philippi, a fantastic place to visit. The archaeological digs in Philippi are sensational. And it happened, as we were going to the place of prayer, which is down by the river, a certain slave girl having a spirit of divination met us. 
<clears throat> now this is not well translated from the Greek in most Bibles. In the Greek she had a pithy in spirit. A pithy in spirit, python, the serpent. She had the serpents. She was a spiritual seductress. Who was bringing her master much profit by fortune telling. One sure indication when the serpent is at work in the church is somebody's making money. <laughs> these televangelists, the false prophets, these clairvoyants pretending to be prophets going around giving people words, what's it always come to? Money. There'll always be a financial aspect to what they do. Like all the occult, the occult always will involve money. False prophets are out to make a profit. It's the Pythian spirit. As soon as the gospel arrived in Europe, the Pythian spirit was there. But look what this woman was saying. Verse 17, following after Paul and us, she kept crying out, These men are bond servants of the Most High who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. Notice, the serpent says true things. When Satan attempted to deceive Jesus, he quoted from Deuteronomy, out of context. Jesus answered from Deuteronomy, in context. When the serpent beguiled Eve, a subtle distortion of something God said. But on the surface, it seems to be true. It seems to be right. All oh, these men are servants of the Most High. Oh, she must be a Christian. Oh, the Pope is a Christian. Oh, the Mormons are Christians. Can you charm the snake? Do you have discernment? Can you distinguish? Because initially, they're saying things that seem right. They initially say things that appear to be true, like any other con artist, only the devil's much better at it. Her master saw their prophet was gone. So they dragged him into the marketplace before the authorities, and they began using the power of law and all this stuff. Quite a thing. Look with me, please, to the book of Amos, chapter 9. Verse 3, And though they hide on the summit of Carmel, I will search them out and take them from there. And though they conceal themselves from my sight on the floor of the sea, from there I will command the serpent and it will bite them. Now you have to understand Mount Carmel and Haifa in Israel, the Galilee coast. It's like the rock of Gibraltar. It looks like it's coming straight out of the sea. So you have a contrast between a mountain and sea level right next to each other. It's a stark piece of geography, it's similar to the Rock of Gibraltar. It doesn't matter if you go to the depths of the sea, you're on top of the mountain. There's no escaping it. When the Lord dispatches the serpent, it's going to bite you, unless you can shun it. The hush bite! But you can't charm it! If you don't know, that's what it is. No discernment, you're going to get bit. Now it's amazing how this works. The nehushtan, the brass thing or the bronze thing from the Hebrew nehoshet. The nehushtan.
as Moses lifted up the brass serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man will be lifted up. Why was Jesus on the cross represented as a serpent in New Testament imagery? He who knew no sin became sin. He had no sin of his own, but he took ours and became, as it were, sin. He who knew no sin became sin. He took our sin to give us his righteousness. We are not just pardoned or forgiven because he paid the price. That's half the truth. The truth is we're actually counted as righteous because he was counted as guilty. That's the whole truth. Yes, we're pardoned because he paid the price. That is absolutely true, praise God. But that's only half the gospel. The other half of the gospel is we're actually counted as righteous because he was counted as guilty. It's quite a thing, isn't it? Quite a thing indeed. If they look at the Nehushtan, they wouldn't get bit. If you look at Jesus on the cross, if that's what you keep your focus on, the crucified Lord would then rise. If you look at him and you realize he's hanging on that cross so you wouldn't have to. You realize he became evil because that's what you are. You look at that. You focus on that. You think of that. And those other serpents won't be able to bite you. If you take your eyes off that cross, you're on the menu. That snake is hungry. Can you charm the snake? Quite a question. Look with me to Matthew chapter 10, verse 16, please. Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves. Shrewd as serpents, but innocent as doves. Right from the beginning, Adam and Eve were told to subdue the earth. The serpent was already in the garden. They were to know that evil existed. They were just not to know it experientially within themselves. We are to be just as shrewd as the enemy. Just as shrewd. My father was a detective in New York. What made a detective different from ordinary policeman was this. A detective could think like a criminal. He had to know how to think the way a criminal would think. Identify the modus operandi and know what a criminal would do and how the criminal mind works. If you couldn't think like a criminal, you couldn't catch one. You couldn't get an indictment or a conviction. You had to think the way they think without actually doing it. I did rescue mission, or did volunteer work with my church in New York on a rescue mission to street people, and we would rescue young people on drugs and teenage prostitutes and things like that. And the people from this church, a lot of them had been on drugs themselves or had been prostitutes themselves and things like that before they got saved. And they were out there trying to reach these people. They knew what a pimp was like and how a pimp thought. They knew how a drug dealer thought. They knew what they were. They were Christians, but they knew everything. They were streetwise. They knew everything these social degenerates were. In fact, some of them, before they got saved, had been social degenerates themselves. I was a cocaine addict when I was a kid. Jesus saved me. Quite a thing. Innocent as a dove, 
wise as a serpent, were called to be as slick and as shrewd as he is. We're not supposed to be naive about evil. We're supposed to be naive about doing it. But not about knowing what it is. We're supposed to know how to charm the snake. But it's much more complicated than that. The game is much trickier. How does the serpent really work? When is the serpent most difficult to discern? Look with me, please, to Matthew 23. Verse 23. So verse 33, Matthew 23, verse 33. What did Jesus say to the Sanhedrin, to the religious leaders? You serpents, you brood of vipers, how shall you escape the judgment of Gehenna? How shall you escape the sentence of hell? What did the serpent do in the garden? Twist the scriptures out of context. What do corrupt preachers do? Twist the scriptures out of context. What do money preaching televangelists do? Twist the scriptures out of context. What does Joyce Meyer do? Twist the scripture out of context. What does Benny Hinn do? Twist the scripture out of context. What, what does Rick Warren do? Twist the scripture out of context. You brood of vipers. But these are the religious leaders of the people. Can you charm the snake? And in the last days, their numbers multiply. And because of apostasy in the church, the Lord sends the snakes in judgment. <coughs> Lachash Bayin, can you discern the snake? How are you going to charm it if you don't know that's what you're even dealing with? Just like the girl with the familiar spirit, the Pythian spirit in Philippi, they know how to misuse the scriptures in a very clever manner even with a counterfeit anointing. What do the Jehovah's Witnesses do when they knock on the door? We know what they do. They misuse the scriptures. The serpent. Can you charm the snake? Look with me, please, to the book of Acts, chapter 28. And brought safely through, we found out the island was called Malta after the shipwreck. And the natives showed us extraordinary kindness. For because of the rain that had set in, and because of the cold, they kindled the fire and deceived us all. But when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened to his hand. And when the natives saw the creature hanging from his hand, they began saying to one another, Undoubtedly, this man is a murderer, and though he has been saved from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. However, he shook the creature off into the fire and suffered no harm. This is a picture, isn't it, of the judgment of Satan in the book of Revelation. That old serpent was cast into the fire. It had no power over Paul. Now, there's a spiritual meaning in this. Very briefly, look with me to the end of the Gospel of St. Mark, please. Mm. 
Verse 18, and they will pick up serpents. In the United States, there is a cultural divide between the North and South, as there is in England, the way a Geordie or a Scouse might look upon a person from London or Oxford. Well, you've got the same thing in the States, between people from New York and Chicago and Boston and so forth, and people who live down in the Bible Belt. It's a cultural divide in the Bible Belt, and they're very peculiar people. I try to avoid preaching in places like Kentucky because they ask me these very difficult theological questions. I've often said this. Reverend, if my wife divorces me, will she still be my half-sister? <laughs> Some of these people in Appalachia are literally inbred. Literally. And I had a friend who was a Southern Baptist missionary to the Arabs in Israel. We were pretty good friends. But he was from the South. His name was David Grossclose, Dr. David Grossclose, really good guy, loved the Lord, and he was evangelist to missionary to Arabs. And to, to Muslims. And uh, you know, I was from New York, and I was a at the time of lay missionary to Jews, evangelists to Jews. And we used to tease each other because I was from New York and he was from, from the American South. And we used to, we were friends, we'd hang out and we used to take the mick out of each other. You Yankee and you rebel and all this stuff, damn thing. And he told me about these people who picked up snakes down where he came from. And I thought he was making fun of me because I was from New York. <laughs> this Yankee will believe anything. I thought he was, I thought he was joking. We used to clown around a lot and make fun of each other and things like that. And I thought he was joking. But then I found out he wasn't joking. There's really people who do that. I couldn't believe there could be people, much less Christians, who could actually be that nuts. They actually pick up the snakes to prove that they're saved. Brother, do you know the Lord Jesus? Well, yes, I came to know the Lord when I was at university in February of 1972. Have you had the test of faith yet? What do you mean? Wilbur, we have a man here who claims to be saved. You say you're saved. We'll just find out. Wilbur, will you bring the sack, please? <laughs> they actually do this. Well, that's not what Jesus was talking about. Now, that verse is actually canonical. It is in Scripture, even though a lot of early manuscripts don't contain it, but it doesn't mean to pick up the snake. It means what happened to Paul in the book of Acts. It illustrates a spiritual principle. You become immune from the venom. The venom's all over. Isaiah says that Amos says it's like wine. The venom is all over the place. And it's getting worse. And it's going to become worse still. The sermon is in short supply. But the snakes are all over the place. And they are biting. You have people professing to be Christians, professing to be born again, believing things and doing things that saved Christians never would have imagined a generation ago. Getting in bed with the Roman church, same-sex marriage, interfaith, things you would never imagine. Divorce and remarriage among believers, things you never would have imagined. The serpent has bit them. They do not love a knowledge of the truth. The snakes are here, and there's more coming. They bite, they kill, they beguile the woman. They tried to get into this church. They tried to get into any church. They tried to get into the mind and heart of any believer they can. 
They pursue the woman in the wilderness. The serpents bite. Can you charm the snake? Do you have discernment? Do you know the incantation? Do you know the lachash? The one thing that will protect you. The whispered incantation. The only thing that will protect you from the serpent's bite. The nechushtayim. Looking at the cross. Looking at Jesus. Lord, I'm not so clever. I'm not so spiritual. I'm not so knowledgeable. I'm not so anything. But I want to be yours. Please, Jesus. Keep my eyes on that cross. Protect me from that serpent. Let me charm that snake. That's the Nahash. If you know that, if you have discernment and you look to the cross, you too will be able to pick up a snake. You'll be immune from its venom. It only works if you can charm the snake ahead of time. My dear friends, in these last days, it is imperative for all of us that we know how to charm the snake. Jeremiah chapter 8.